The Chupacabra's spoiling attack was a minor success, in that it blunted the initial assault onto the town of Mortarborn and gave pause to the House Corbin players' execution of their Operation Bum Rush. The Corbin players could now see a clear operational picture of the defenses that the Chupacabras have drawn up for the city of Azul Harbor. The forces were holding key avenues of approach through the towns of Mortarborn and Frigid Cape. The flanks of the League forces were protected by the Tortel Mountains to the west and the Azul Bay to the northeast. Thus, the Chupacabras had created a bottleneck that the Corbin players would need to fight through in order to get to their objective, the city of Azul Harbor. But what made the Corbin players most concerned were these two little mech lances hanging out on the road between Mortarborn and Frigid Cape. The Corbin players rightly concluded that the League forces were going to use their interior lines to shift their forces either to Frigid Cape or Mortarborn, depending on the direction the Corbin players attacked. This was unfortunate for the Corbin players. No matter which town they attacked, they wouldn't have superior numbers. They would likely be attacking a force roughly the same size, or perhaps even larger than their own. And they needed superior numbers to help shore up their lacking pilot and gunnery skills of their mech warriors. Things were not looking good for the Corbin players. This was also unfortunate for the League forces as well. The Chupacabras knew they were in a good defensive position, but to hold that position, they needed to keep the majority of their forces deployed in that region, which will have a negative impact on the decision making of the League players, but more on that later. So the players found themselves in a good old standoff. The Corbin players were too afraid to attack and gamble their forces, and the League forces were not eager to move away from their strong position. This is when the Corbin players had a eureka moment. To the south, the League forces had deployed one Chupacabra company of mechs to hold the town of Easterwich, but they were also deployed in such a way that left them a tad exposed. The Corbin players began to consider an attack on Easterwich. If the Corbin forces launched an attack there, it would threaten the entire Hazi Valley, which could do one of two things. One, threaten the eastern approach to the city of Reston, which is a political and strategic city for the League forces, a city that they would desperately defend. Or two, threaten the northern approaches to Sapphire Bay, which is politically divided between the League and Corbin forces, which, to be honest, neither side wanted, because half the people there either like your faction or hate your faction. But threatening the Hazi Valley would force the Chupacabras to respond, and maybe, just maybe, weaken their defensive posture east of the Tortel Mountains. However, this is where things got a little bit Cold War cat and mouse like. The League forces saw the Corbin forces approaching Easterwich, but they thought it was a decoy, a distraction, not the actual push that was inevitably coming toward Mortarborn or Frigicate, so the League forces held their positions and waited. On the other hand, the Corbin players thought, surely the Chupacabras wouldn't want to fight in Easterwich and would withdraw north to Sinehelm, where their artillery battery is located. But then, that didn't happen either. And so, like watching a slow train wreck, both sides watched their forces come in contact at Easterwich. Even when battle was declared, the League players were still hesitant to commit any reserve forces. They were still convinced that this was not going to be the main thrust of the Corbin attack. But eventually, they did decide to pay the cost to at least support their defense at Easterwich with the artillery battery. So here we are, a battle that neither side thought was going to happen. This is the Battle of Easterwich. Easterwich. This quaint town has residential and commercial buildings, all of which have a construction factor of 1. This industrial building has a construction factor of 4. The Chupacabras will need to deploy within 6 inches of any of the residential buildings. House Corbin forces will attack from the east and will deploy along that edge of the map. House Corbin's forces have deployed their 5th mech company. It is comprised of two assault lances and a light striker lance. Both assault lances, the red assault and the blue assault, each have a Centaurian, a Banshee, a Grasshopper, and a Hatchetman. Their special pilot ability for this lance formation is Demoralizer, which can be given to half of the lance during the battle. The Light Striker is comprised of a Panther, a Jenner, a Blackjack, and a Wolfhound. They took Speed Demon as their lance special pilot ability, which increases their ground and sprint speeds. This was given to the Blackjack, Jenner, and the Panther. As for the Chubacabras, 
This mech company was the last company that this player made, and I think she was simply just trying to buy mechs to assign to pilots, because none of her lances have any special lance formations. So they're simply named the 13th, 14th, and 15th lance. In the 13th lance, it is comprised of a Blackhawk, a Dasher, a Locust, and a Wasp. For the 14th lance, it has a Stalker, a Wasp, a Wraith, and a Zeus. And for the 15th lance, the Marauder, a Rifleman, a Vulture, and a Loki. They also have two barrages of Thumper artillery that will be available to the Chupacabras starting in turn 3. There are no objectives on this battlefield, this is just a straight up firefight. Looks like House Corbin wins the initiative. The Chupacabras will need to move first and shoot first for turn 1. The 13th Lance stands still, held in reserve. The Chupacabras want to see how the forces of House Corbin will deploy. Red Assault sprints up the right side moving into the hills to get in position to attack the Chupacabras left flank. For the Chupacabras, the 14th Lance is then activated. They ground move as well as the Wasp jump to an advanced position up the right side. Next, House Corbin activates the Blue Assault, which did a general advance on the center right. They're not sure yet if they want to attack the center or the right flank. Next up is the 15th Lance. The Marauder and Rifleman sprinted back toward a gentle slope with the intent to secure a high ground firing position. The Loki and Vulture move forward to blunt any enemy advance along that flank. The Corbin Light Strikers are the last to move. The Panther and Blackjack move along the right flank. The Jenner ground moves into some woods, and the Wolfhound runs along the road. On to the shooting phase. The Chupacabras are the first to shoot. The Wraith and Wasp open fire on the Wolfhound. Their skill is 5, TMM of the Wolfhound is 3, and they are at medium range. The target number comes to a 10 for the Wraith, but a 12 for the Wasp since it had jumped this turn. The Wasp missed, but the Wraith hit with an 11, inflicting 3 damage. The Stalker and Zeus shoot at the Wolfhound as well. They are both at long range and the target number is 12 for the Zeus, but because the Stalker has better skills, its target number is 11. But unfortunately, they both miss. The 13th Lance was held in reserve and did not have any line of sight on the approaching Corbin forces. Now for House Corbin to fire back. The Jenner fires at the Wraith. It has a skill of 4, a ground move, so plus 0, the TMM of the Wraith is 3, and it has partial cover and intervening woods at medium range, so the target number is 11 and the Jenner missed with an 8. The Wolfhound also fires at the Wraith at medium range. It has a skill of 4, a ground move, so plus 0, the TMM of the Wraith is 3. Since the Wolfhound has better line of sight without intervening woods or cover blocking its fire, the target number is 9, but it also missed with a roll of a 6. Blackjack and the Panther now shoot at the Wraith. It has a skill of 4, the TMM is 3, it has no cover, and the range is 2 for medium range, bringing the target number to a 9, and they also both missed. No other mechs had line of sight, nor were in range to engage the enemy. And that brings us to the end of turn 1. Now we roll for initiative for turn 2, and it looks like the Chupacabras win. House Corbin will move and shoot first. Corbin's light strikers move closer to the industrial building, with the Jenner jumping on top of the building and the Panther jumping into the woods for cover. The Chupacabras activate the 14th Lance, with the Wasp jumping on top of the industrial building as well, and the Wraith shifting their position for more cover, but it wasn't enough movement to be considered a ground move, and so it's basically stood still. The Zeus and Stalker ground move towards the industrial building, looking for targets. House Corbin activates Red Assault, which at first was going to continue up the left side, but then the player realized that they would have infillate fire on the Stalker, and instead moves to the hill's edge. The Chupacoppers activate the 13th Lance. The Dasher, true to its name, dashes from its position down the road up the hill to the other side of the hill and gets into position to fire at the Red Assault. The Blackhawk and the Wasp use jump jets to move to the other side of the neighborhood. The Locust leaves its position in the woods and moves towards the right flank of the Chupacabras. Blue Assault considers to sprint down the center of the map, but then decides to move to the left to line up some shots on the Zeus and the Stalker. The Marauder and Rifleman continue to ground move up the slope of the hill, hoping to get some elevated shots on the attacking forces of House Corbin. The Vulture and Loki make their way out of town and start to move towards the center of the map. On to the shooting phase. House Corbin will shoot first. Blue Assault pour all their firepower into the Chupacabra's Zeus. Their skill is 5. They ground move, so it's 0. 
TMM for the Zeus is 1. There's no cover, so plus 0. And it's at medium range. This brings the target number to an 8. The Centurion and Banshee both miss with a 5 and a 3. However, the Hatchman hits with a 9, inflicting 3 damage. The Grasshopper rolls a critical hit. It rolled a 4 on the critical damage, damaging the fire control of the Zeus. Next up, the Panther fires at the Zeus. The target number is a 7, and it missed with a 4. Next up is the Jenner, Wolfhound, and the Blackjack, which all fire at the Wasp. The Jenner's skill is 4. It had jumped this turn, so it's plus 2. The TMM is 2. However, because the Wasp also jumped, it's an additional plus 1, and it has cover, so plus 1, but it's at short range. This brings the target number to a 10, and they all miss with a roll of 8 or less. Red Assault had several options to choose from for shooting. First, there was the Wasp, which was at medium range without cover. The Zeus and Wraith, also at medium range, but had partial cover from some of the mechs in the Red Assault. The Stalker, it was the most deadly, but it was at long range for most of the mechs in the Red Assault. So the Corbin player decided to split up their shots. The Hatchman and Banshee will shoot at the Zeus, and the Centurion and the Grasshopper will light up the Wasp. For the Hatchman and Banshee, the target number is 9. And the Hatchman hits with a 10, which scored structural damage, causing critical damage to the weapons. As for the Grasshopper and Centurion shooting at the Wasp, the target number for Grasshopper is 9. However, for the Centurion, the target number is 10, since the Wasp had some partial cover. And they both miss. But because the Centurion rolled a 9, which would have hit if not for the partial cover, so the Industrial Building takes the hit, lowering its construction factor from a 4 to a 3. Now the Chupacabra shoot back. The Wasp and Wraith take a shot at the Jenner. When figuring the target number for the Wraith, it has a skill of 5, but it stood still, so minus 1. The TMM for the target is 3, which also had partial cover, so plus 1. So the target number it comes to an 8. As for the Wasp though, since it had jumped, its target number is an 11. They both rolled an 8, which is a miss for the Wasp and a hit for the Wraith, inflicting 3 damage to the Jenner's armor. Next up is the Zeus and Stalker, all lining up their attacks for the Blue Assault Grasshopper. The target number for the Zeus is 10. This is due to its skill being a 5, as well as having damage to its fire control. But for the Stalker's target number, it comes to a 7. And the Zeus misses with Snake Eyes, and the Stalker hits with an 8, taking 6 points of armor off the Grasshopper. The Marauder and Riflemen of the 15th Lance try to shoot at the Red Hatchetman hanging out on the low-lying hill. The target number is 11, and they both miss. The Vulture and Loki don't have line of sight on Red Assault but they both can see the Wolfhound in House Corbin's Light Striker. The target number is 11 due to intervening woods, and both mechs miss with a 6 and an 8. The Locust attacks the Blue Hatchetman with a target number of 8, and hits with an 8, inflicting 2 damage to the Hatchetman's armor. And that brings turn 2 to a close. Here we are in turn 3 for the initiative roll, and Corbin wins initiative. Chupacabras will move first and shoot first. Chupacabras activate the 15th Lance. The Loki and Vulture cut across that copse of woods in order to both close on the Red Assault and to possibly get shots off at the Blue Assault Lance. The Marauder and Riflemen might be regretting taking the high road, but they continue to traverse the hills to try to get an angle on the enemy mechs below. Confident that the Red Assault Lance can hold the right flank, Blue Assault maneuvers on the left flank. Both the Hatchman and the Grasshopper jump in order to increase their TMM. Hopefully they can close with the enemy so it can make use of its special pilot ability, Demoralizer. Concerned that the 13th Lance is about to be overwhelmed, the Chupacabra player had the Lance fall back. However, the player still wanted to hold the hill that is in the center of the map, and therefore had the Wraith and Wasp jump to that position. The Corbin player, seeing how they are pushing the Chupacabras back from the middle, decides to keep the pressure on. Therefore, the Grasshopper and Hatchetman of the Red Assault continue to push down towards the Loki and Vulture and the Banshee and the Centurion ground move to get better shots. The Chupacabras activate the 13th Lance. The Black Hawk and the Wasp jump forward to positions to get off some shots, and the Locust ground moves 18 inches up the hill, and the Dasher ground moves off the hill to get a shot off at the Hatchman of the Red Assault. Finally, House Corbin activates their last Lance, the Light Strikers. The Jenner has done his job and held the industrial building, and the player had considered to jump it off of the building, but the player decided to leave it in place even though the TMM is lower due to standing still. The Panther jumped up on top of the building with the Jenner, putting the building's weight capacity nearly at its maximum. Wolfhound and the Blackjack ground move to the left. On to the shooting phase. 
The Chupacabras open up their shooting phase by calling in an artillery strike against the Panther. The artillery hits, stripping one point of armor from the Panther. Next up is the Blackhawk, which fires at the general on top of the industrial building. The Blackhawk's skill is 4. It jumped this turn, so plus 2. The Jenner has stood still this turn, so its TMM is 0. However, the Jenner has partial cover, so that's plus 1. And it's at medium range, so another plus 2. Therefore, the target number is 9. And the Blackhawk rolled an 11, which does 4 damage to the Jenner, which is enough to destroy the mech. However, the Jenner still will be able to shoot this turn before it is removed from the battle. Next up, the Stalker and Zeus take aim at the Blackjack. Since the Zeus has critical damage to its fire control, the target number is a 10. For the Stalker, the target number is 7, and they both missed. The Wasp, Wraith, and Locust all take aim at the Panther. The target number for the Locust is a 10. However, since the Panther had jumped and the Wasp and Wraith also jumped, their target number is a 12, and all three mechs missed the Panther. The Loki and Vulture decide to fire at the Grasshopper in the woods. The target number is 10 due to the intervening woods and since the Grasshopper had jumped this turn. The Loki missed, but the Vulture hit, inflicting 4 damage to the Grasshopper's armor. From the top of the high hills, the Marauder and Rifleman, as well as the Dasher at the base of the hill, all take aim at the Red Assault Hatchetman. The target number is 9. The Dasher and Marauder miss, but the Rifleman finds his mark, inflicting 4 damage to the Hatchetman. Now House Corbin shoots back. The entire Light Strikers, including the Down Jenner, take aim at the Black Hawk. The Wolfhound and the Black Jack have a target number of 9, but the Panther has a target number of 11 since it had jumped this turn. As for the Jenner, the target number is 7 since it had stood still this turn. The Panther and Wolfhound miss, but the Jenner hits, taking 3 points of armor off the Black Hawk. The Black Jack also hits, inflicting another 3 points of damage which also removes structure points. This caused potential critical damage, which was a rolled 11 destroying the engines of the Black Hawk. Wanting to finish off the Black Hawk, Red Assault Satorian shoots at the Black Hawk. The target number is 10, and it rolled an 11, which took the last two points of structure from the Black Hawk, destroying it. Next, the entire Blue Assault Lance take aim at the heavily damaged Zeus. For the Centurion, the target number is 8. However, since the Grasshopper and Hatchetman had jumped, their target number is 10. The Banshee is at long range, so its target number is also 10. Both the Grasshopper and Hatchetman miss, but the Centurion and the Banshee hit, which caused enough damage to destroy the Zeus. The rest of Red Assault activate now, and take aim at the Loki below them in the woods. The Banshee's target number is 8, since the Loki has woods between it and the Banshee. The Hatchetman doesn't have any intervening woods between it and the Loki, but it did jump this turn, so its target number is 9. And the Grasshopper both jumped and it has intervening woods, so its target number is 10. Both the Grasshopper and the Hatchman hit, inflicting 6 points of damage, removing all of Loki's armor and inflicting structure damage which critically damaged the movement speed of the Loki. Fortunately for the Loki, the Banshee missed. And that brings turn 3 to a close. Things aren't looking too good for the Chupacabras. They lost 2 mechs. The only mech holding the Chupacabra's left flank is the Stalker, which has two enemy mech lances bearing down on him. The Chupacabras need to win initiative so they can get into better fighting positions. The Chupacabras really wanted to win initiative for this turn, but they failed to do so. Therefore, they're going to have to move first as well as shoot first. The Chupacabras decided to withdraw from the battlefield. First, the 14th Lance was activated, trying to both hold the left flank while maneuvering away from the battle. The Stalker took cover behind some houses, and the Wraith jumps into cover behind a thicket of woods. Sensing weakness, the Light Strikers began to position themselves at the base of the hill to prepare for an assault on the center of the map. Next is the 15th Lance, which begins to move back looking for cover. However, the Loki has reduced movement and is traversing through woods, so it cannot move very far. The Rifleman and Marauder stand still to provide covering fire for the retreating Chupacabras. The Blue Assault Lance did a general advance on the left flank to keep the pressure on the Chupacabras. The 13th Lance is next to move. The Locust ground moves into the neighborhood, followed by the Wasp that jumped into the same neighborhood. The Dasher falls back next to the Vulture. Red Assault decides to push down further into the right flank, and they are determined to destroy that Loki. On to the shooting phase. The Chupacabras open up their shooting phase again with the last barrage of artillery against the Red Hatchman, but unfortunately it missed and splashed harmlessly nearby. The Dasher, Vulture, and the Wasp wanted to shoot at the approaching Red Assault, but it turns out the woods are too thick and prevents line of sight, 
Therefore, they fire at the Panther, which is out in the open. The target number for the Dasher and Vulture is 9, but since the Wasp stood still, the target number is reduced to 7. The Dasher and Wasp miss, but the Vulture hits, inflicting 4 damage, which also damages the structure. This caused a critical damage roll, which was a 7, reducing the movement speed of the Panther. Next up is the Rifleman, which takes aim at that same Panther. The target number is an 11, and the Rifleman rolled exactly that inflicting 4 damage to the panther which is more than enough to destroy it. However, the downed panther can still make their attacks this turn. The marauder takes aim at the red hatchet. Since it stood still, the target number is 7, and it scored a hit which was enough to destroy it. The hatchman, however, will still be able to make its attacks for this turn. The loki rolls their check to see if they're demoralized by the proximity of the red assault grasshopper, and he is. This will make it easier for him to be attacked this turn. However, he takes aim at the grasshopper and unfortunately misses with a roll of snake eyes. This leaves the wraith which takes a shot at the wolfhound with a target number of 10. And unfortunately the wraith missed. Now it's time for House Corbin to shoot back. All of Red Assault, including the downed hatchetman, fire at the Loki. The target number is low due to the short range as well as the TMM of the Loki reduced due to being demoralized. Despite this, the Banshee, Hatchman, and the Centurion miss, which gave a brief glimmer of hope for the Chupacabras. However, the Grasshopper successfully hit the Loki, dealing 2 damage, which was enough to destroy the Loki. At this point, the game turned into an all-out retreat for the Chupacabras. The Chupacabras lost 3 mechs, as well as control of Easterwich. House Corbin also lost 3 mechs, but they now control the town of Easterwich, and therefore have opened access to the entire Pazi Valley. This was a pretty big defeat for the Chupacabras. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up and leave a comment below. If you want to see more videos and battle reports from Battletech and historicals and fantasy, please subscribe to the channel. And if you want to help the channel grow, check out our Patreon page and see if there's anything there that might interest you. Okay, Wargamers, I'll see you next time.